Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today we are doing our third killer proof strategy. It is proof by cases. Unlike the other two killer proof strategies I've given you before, this one is less general and much more specific. However, when proof by cases pops up, it takes what would otherwise be a complex problem and turns it into something pretty trivial. The structure of proof by cases looks like this. You need to have two implications and one disjunction. Notice that in the first two implications, the only two implications on lines one and two, we have the same consequent. It's R in both cases, whereas there's a different antecedent. Then in the disjunction that we have as the third premise, we have the disjunction of the two antecedents, P or Q. And if you have this framework, then you can conclude that the consequent of those two conditional statements is true. And you can actually figure this out for yourself by filling in a little bit of a proof, right? I've left a couple of lines right there for you. So maybe as an exercise for yourself, you might want to stop here and figure out how you can use those three pieces of information in just two lines to conclude R. Well, if you've done that, you might want to go ahead and submit it as a comment on the comment section below this video. But if you've done that, then this is the solution. So you might remember constructive dilemma from a long time ago in our rules of inference. Constructive dilemma says that if we have exactly what those three premises are, then we can conclude the disjunction between the two consequents in the two implications. So that gives us R or R. And then using idepotence, remember that one? It's another random one that we haven't seen in a very long time. You can erase one of those parts of the or are statements and, and just get your R by yourself right there and you're done. That's it. That's all you need. Now, this might not exactly be intuitive, but here is some intuition to make it obvious why this is the case and why this works. Imagine you have the following three premises. First, if you are Tim Cook, you are rich. Second, if you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you are rich. Notice that those are two implications with the identical consequence. And third, you are Tim Cook or you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Notice that's a disjunction and it's a disjunction of the two antecedents in the previous two statements. So this has the exact same framework as what we saw before. If we have those things, then we can conclude that you are rich. Because in one case, you're Tim Cook, and in that case, you're rich, and in the second case, you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and so in that case, by the second line, you're still rich. And of course, if you're both of those things, then you're still rich. You're good to go. That's the intuition behind proof by cases. Now, when you're actually applying proof by cases, it gets to be a little bit more complicated. And the reason I say that is as follows. We actually saw this problem once before. This was in our second proof practice video. And I thought more about this later on, and I realized that the solution that I worked through the first time using a proof by contradiction was actually far less intuitive than working through a proof by cases. If you do proof by cases, this problem actually becomes fairly easy. So to recall, we have three premises here. We have R or S implies T, P or Q implies T, and R or P, and we want to conclude that T is true. So this is another opportunity for you to do some practice work on your own. You might want to pause the video here and try to work out how to solve this problem using proof by cases. And I just want to note here that you can't automatically solve this one because while it has a very similar structure to what we've seen before with two implications, with an identical consequent, and a disjunction, notice that the disjunction that we have in line three is not a disjunction between the two antecedents in lines one and two. Instead, it's just part of it. It's just R and not R or S, and it's just P instead of P or Q. So you might want to pause the video here, try to work this out for yourself. Maybe go ahead and submit it as a comment down below. And if you've tried it for yourself, I can now explain it to you. You can check your work and, and see if you're right, or also figure out the answer if you were struggling with it. So basically what we need to be doing here to turn this into a proof by cases is to acquire two implications that we don't currently have. The third premise there that R or P works for us. What we need to do though to get it to look exactly like that framework that you've seen previously, we need to get R or T or rather R implies T 
and P implies T rather than those parenthetical statements like R or S implies T. So if we can figure out somehow to create an R implies T line and a P implies T line, then we can use our constructive dilemma and then use a depotence to get T by itself and then we'd be done. Okay, so instead of trying to solve the problem in some complicated way, like a proof by contradiction, which we're kind of just diving into and seeing where it takes us, here there's a lot more structure to the problem. We have worked backward, and we have figured out that instead of trying to prove T, if instead we try to prove R implies T and P implies T, then that would be the end of the proof for us, and we would be finished. So how do we do that? How do we go about figuring this one out? Well, we have these implications, and what we should know about conditional statements is that if you need to prove a conditional statement, the easiest way of doing that is to start out by assuming the antecedent. So if we want to show that R implies T, we should start off by assuming R is true as an assumption for a conditional proof, and then work from there. All right, so if we know that R is true, what can we do? Well, we see on line one that if we can get R or S, then we can have T through modus ponens. And if we have R as already being true, then to acquire R or S is very simple. We just need to have a disjunction introduction. So that takes us to line five. We have R or S as a disjunction that has just been introduced. And now that we have R or S, we can use lines five, one and five apply modus ponens to them and get t out. And then we're done with this conditional proof. That's the end of the conditional proof because we started with r, we've shown that if r is true, then t follows from there, and so that wraps up the conditional proof and we have on line 7 r implies t. That means we have one thing left to do. All we need to do now is show that p implies t, but actually this is fairly simple because it's the exact same process that we just did on lines 4 through 6. So if we start off trying to prove an implication, we want to take the antecedent as true and see where it goes, use it as an assumption for a conditional proof. So if we do that, we can then apply disjunction introduction, just like we did on line 5. This time we're making it look like P or Q, because that's what appears on line 2. We do that through a disjunction introduction. That's good to go. Then using lines 2 and 9, and applying modus ponens, we get T, and then that wraps up the conditional proof because we started off with assuming that P is true, and we've shown that T follows from there. And now that we have those two implications, we're done, basically. We just need to apply the constructive dilemma and then reduce the constructive dilemma using a depotence. And that is it. That is proof by cases for you. So just to recap here, when you're looking for proof by cases, you're seeing that there is a premise that involves a disjunction and then two implications that uh, allow you to conclude if the antecedent is true, that the consequent is true and the consequent is identical in both of those cases. So if you have those three things, that's your recipe for a, uh, a proof by cases, and you should bust out the proof by cases and get to your answer that way. Proof by cases is actually really useful. You don't actually use it too much in your sentential logic classes, like if you're taking this in a philosophy department, but if you're a mathematician, my goodness, do you use this a lot? Because you can actually build these situations that look like, well, either A or B has to be true, and if A is true, then C is true, and if B is true, then C is true, and so that means C is just true. This happens so much in mathematics. This is a more of a mathematical tool than a logical tool that you'll see in the sentential logic framework, but nevertheless, it is really useful when it comes up because it gives you this nice structured way of figuring out solutions to problems. That wraps up this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.